Our program will start in one minute. Hello, and welcome to today's virtual reception, The Japanese Rescuer, a lesson in bravery for the struggle against anti-Semitism, co-hosted by the Combat Anti-Semitism Movement and B'nai B'rith International. Today, we are honoring the late Japanese diplomat, Shiuni Sugihara, ahead of International Holocaust Remembrance Day, which is this Wednesday, January 27th. I'll be your host, Laura Hemlock, chair of B'nai B'rith Connect in New York City. We have an impressive lineup for you this morning. We'll have the privilege of hearing the personal testimony of Nathan Lewin and Ada Winston, who as children were among the, around the 6,000 European Jews who survived the Holocaust, thanks to the transit visa signed by Sugihara in Lithuania in the summer of 1940 against the orders of his superiors. Our keynote speaker will be His Excellency, Kanji Yamanuchi, Ambassador and Council General of Japan in New York. Additionally, we are featuring a distinguished group of experts, all of whom will share their insights on Sugihara's legacy and Japan's relations with Israel, the United States, and the global Jewish community. Finally, we'll be joined by the Japanese American artist Jury, who will make a special presentation. For now, I would like to welcome Barney Breen Portnoy, editor in chief for the Combat Anti Semitism Movement. Thank you, uh, thank you, Laura. Cam is honored to co-host this event with B'nai B'rith International. Um, if you have any questions as you watch this event on Zoom, Facebook, or YouTube, please write them in the comments section and we will try to have the relevant speakers address them uh, time permitting. Um, as, the Holocaust of the, as the horrors of the Holocaust recede into the past, we commit ourselves to preserving the memories of those who lived through the horrors of the Shoah. With anti-Semitism refusing to go away, is important more is, is important now more than ever that the lessons of the Holocaust continue to be shared. We're confident that stories such as Suji Haras can inspire future generations to do their part in helping to create a better world. We'll begin with a brief video highlighting Suji Haras' courageous actions, followed by opening remarks from B'nai B'rith International CEO Daniel Mariachin.
We're deeply grateful to each of you for joining us for this important program. Your participation is a testimony to the importance of remembering the Holocaust and of properly preserving and teaching its enduring lessons. Today's event is the first in a series of B'nai B'rith programs this week to commemorate International Holocaust Remembrance Day, and one that symbolizes the uniqueness and vitality of our work and that of our partners at the Combat Anti-Semitism Movement, or CAM. Serving and representing the Jewish people while bringing Jewish values and commitment in the service of all people. At great risk to himself and his family, Japanese diplomat Chiyuni Sugihara dared to do what was right, signing transit visas in order to save thousands of Jews from extermination by the Nazis. So dedicated to the task of saving lives was Sugihara that after the Japanese consulate in Kaunas, Lithuania was closed by the Soviets in 1940, it is said that he threw blank visas out the train window as he departed Kaunas, which you saw depicted in our short film. Consul General Sugihara stood up when the world was largely silent. Like all rescuers and righteous souls, he did not view what he did in saving thousands of lives as anything remarkable. Describing his actions in later years, Sugihara modestly said that he had made the effort because simply the Jews needed help. Everyone would do this, he believed, if they were in the same position. Of course, we know that this was not the case. As Sugihara's actions teach, one person certainly can make a difference. There are a few other upstanding Holocaust era diplomats and we know these courageous rescuers paid a tremendous price for doing good. Like others, Sugihara's career was derailed and decades passed before his courageous deeds were publicly recognized. He did live to be honored as one of the righteous among the nations by Yad Vashem in 1985, the only Japanese citizen to be so recognized. He died the next year. Today, he's a hero in Japan. In 2017, through our NGO status at UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, B'nai B'rith enthusiastically endorsed an application by Sugihara's hometown to register Sugihara and documents to his rescue efforts with the UNESCO Memory of the World program. Sugihara has not only left a lasting legacy in the tens of thousands of descendants of those saved by his transit visas, but in the rich and dynamic relationship Japan now shares with the state of Israel and the global Jewish community of which we'll soon learn more from our esteemed speakers. For B'nai B'rith's part, we're proud to have forged several connections with Japan as we have met and worked closely with ambassadors and key diplomats from Washington DC to Tokyo, including a 2019 executive delegation to Japan, concluding with a private meeting with then Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. And of course, our dear friend Kanji Yamanuchi, whom we're so grateful to host here today. In March 2011, the Neighborhood International immediately opened its disaster relief fund after the devastating earthquake and tsunami, which helped bring Israel's emergency teams quickly to Japan. Our organization has also sent multiple delegations from the Neighborhood Connect, our network of young leaders to Japan, as participants in the Kakahashi Project, a bridge for tomorrow. This cultural exchange program is promoted by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan to strengthen mutual understanding and cooperation among the people of Japan and the United States. We look forward to the future beyond the pandemic when we can once again travel and resume this important exchange in person. Sugihara's was the most courageous, highest expression of humanity and caring for others. It is upon us to fittingly recognize the role and legacy he has left. His memory is one we must honor, and we do that today. Thanks so much, Dan, for your remarks. As a past participant of the Kakahashi Project with B'nai B'rith, this program has particular meaning for me. Nathan Lewin, honorary president of the American Association of Jewish Lawyers Jurists, was one of the Jews who owes his life to Sugihara. Mr. Lewin, we're so grateful you could join us to share your story today. Welcome. 
Thank you very much. All who have zoomed in to watch this, distinguished ambassador <clears throat> and consul general of Japan, it's both an honor and a blessing really for me to be able to be here today to share with you my admiration and thanks for an individual who really embodied the rule that our rabbis in their great wisdom in the ethics of the fathers said many years ago that you should not do a good deed with the expectation that you will be rewarded, but do a good deed for the good deed itself. And that was what Chuni Sugihara did. No expectation of reward. In fact, an expectation which lasted until finally he was recognized of being harmed by his employers. I have to begin this story by the list of Sugihara transit visas that was made available by the Foreign Office of Japan when Sugihara's story was beginning to be studied. In this list, on this list of transit visas issued by Consul Sugihara in the month of July, there appear as numbers 16, 17, and 18, a Dutch citizen by the name of Rachel Sternheim, a Polish citizen by the name of Isaac Levine, and a Dutch citizen by the name of Levy Sternheim. How did it happen that in July 26, 1940, these three individuals, Rachel Sternheim, who was my grandmother, Isaac Levine, who was my father, together I'm sure with my mother, Pepe Sternheim Levine, and Levy Sternheim, who was my uncle, the brother of my mother, how did they happen to be in Kaunas at the consulate of Japan before Chuni Sugihara on the 26th of July in 1940? The story is a fascinating one. And unfortunately, all its details will take much more time than is allotted to me in this wonderful program. How come two Dutch citizens and a Polish citizen appeared in the Japanese consulate in Kaunas on the 26th of July? The truth is this was the opening for with which Chuni Sugihara, with his extraordinary kindness and disinterestedness, no selfishness involved, opened the door for thousands of refugees from Poland to be able to find a haven in free countries of the world. I was born in Lodz in 1936. My mother, the Dutch, a Dutch citizen, the daughter of Rachel Sternheim, married my father, who was a Polish citizen and the son of a very famous Polish rabbi who was a member, in fact, of the Polish Sejm, the Polish legislature, twice elected by the Jews of Poland. They settled in Lodz, where I was born in 1936. My mother, who was Western educated and had attended the University of Berlin, followed the news very closely. Unlike, unfortunately, most Jews of Poland. And she knew what a threat Hitler was. She made my father promise that when, when and if, if Hitler crossed the border into Poland, we would immediately try to escape and leave Poland. And in fact, my father, who was as a young man, a member of the city council of Lodz, 
agreed to her demands and we escaped across the border into Lithuania in 19th, September of 1939. And I was told, although I don't personally recall it, that as a three-year-old, I was carried in the night through the forest in order to be able to make it safely to Lithuania. We ar arrived in Vilna, Vilnius, with many other Jews who had escaped from Poland. And my mother, again, with her extraordinary foresight and amazing, incisive intelligence, said, we can't stay here. We have to get out of Vilnius. And as a former Dutch citizen, she had lost her Dutch citizenship because she married my father, who was a Polish citizen. And as a former Dutch citizen, she asked the Dutch consul in Kaunas, Jan Zwartendijk, to see whether she could travel to the Dutch East Indies. He turned her down because he said no visas were being issued by the Dutch to the Dutch East Indies and certainly not to Polish citizens. Well, my mother did not take no for an answer. She wrote to Mr. Zwartendijk's superior, the Dutch ambassador in Riga, whose name was De Decker, and said, will I be able to get a visa to the Dutch East Indies for my mother, who was a Dutch citizen, and my brother, who was also still a Dutch citizen? And the, when De Decker answered that there were no visas being issued, she asked him where they could go. And Ambassador De Decker said, you'll be able to go to Suriname or Curaçao, the Dutch West Indies, because no visa is needed to go there. And if the governor of Suriname or Curaçao, who's a Dutch official, will allow you in, you can come in without a visa. My mother said, that's terrific. And she wrote back to Ambassador De Decker and said, here is my Polish passport. Please write into the Polish passport that no visa is needed for Suriname or Curaçao. You can leave out the matter, the business of the governor, because I don't think we're gonna go to Curaçao. And the Decker, to his credit, said, okay. And he wrote that in French into her passport. She then went back to Mr. Jan Zwartendijk. And she said, will you please write into our travel document? We then had a Lithuanian travel document, a Leidimas. There's a picture of my father and my mother and myself. Not as cute as other photographs of me. I look better really in those early days than the photograph that appears on this Lighty Moss. But Mr. Jan Zwartendijk agreed. He said, well, if that's what the ambassador says, I'll write it in. And he wrote it in French that no visa is needed to Suriname or Curaçao. That was an amazing document because although it was not a visa, it indicated that the person who was holding it had a destination that would admit him or her. That was unusual because in those days, no country was ready to admit the Jews who were refugees. So when, Zwan, when Jan Zwartendijk wrote that into the document, my mother had a destination, but how was she gonna get there? And my recollection is that she mentioned to me that Jan Zwartendijk had suggested to her that there was a possibility by going by way of Japan and that the Japanese consul might be the route to do that. That's how she and my father and my grandmother, the only grandparent, by the way, who survived the war, my other three grandparents were killed during the war. My paternal grandmother 
was gassed in Belzec. My maternal grandfather was gassed in Auschwitz. My paternal grandfather, the great rabbi of Zeshev, who had been in the Polish parliament, was killed in a riot by the Ukrainians in 1941 as the Russian army left Lvov and the German army was coming in. But Rachel Sternheim was a grandmother who survived. But in 1940, in July of 1940, she and her son Levy and her daughter Pepe or Pessel and her son-in-law Isaac were there in front of Chuni Sugihara. And Mr. Sugihara did not hesitate. He wrote out a visa that was repeated. And this is the original Sugihara visa. The first, I think, Sugihara transit visa for Jews to go to Suriname or Curacao. And he wrote it out on July 26, 1940. That's my story. And that's the story of Sugihara who wrote out another 2,000 such visas, not to citizens of the Netherlands. He didn't care whether they were citizens of the Netherlands or of Germany or of Poland or of Lithuania. He knew they were human beings who had to be rescued and whose lives were at stake. Shuni Sugihara, it's a very strange first name, Shuni. If you turn it into Hebrew, C-H-I-U-N-E, C-H in Hebrew is pronounced Chiyuni. Chi, Chi means life. Life, Chiyuni Sugihara gave life. I'm wearing a tie that has the Hebrew letters Ches Yud, Chi, life. Chiyuni Sugihara gave life, not only to the 6,000 Jews who, to whom he issued transit visas in that one month, the one month, July, August of 1940, before they called him back. And before those, as was reported, he was throwing visas out of the train in order to save Jews who needed those documents in order to survive. This is the week in which the Jewish nation celebrates Tu B'Shvat, the holiday of plants, new year for trees, life. A tree, a freshly planted tree is a sign of life. So it's appropriate that in this month, at this time, we recognize and we honor the memory of Chiyuni Sugihara. Thank you. Wow, well, thank you so much, Mr. Lewin, for sharing that incredible story. And I love that interpretation of his first name. Um, I'd like to now welcome Eliza D. Lewin, President and General Counsel of the Louis D. Brandeis Center for Human Rights Under Law and daughter of Nathan Lewin, who will talk about the relevance of Sugihara's story to combating anti-Semitism today. Thank you, Laura, and thank you, Sasha, and the Combat Anti-Semitism Movement and B'nai B'rith International for putting this whole program together and for inviting the Brandeis Center to be a co-sponsor. I'm truly honored to have been included with this illustrious group here today, including the Honorable Ambassador, my father, my friend, Ken Weinstein, to pay tribute to Shiyuni Sugihara. I cannot remember how young I was when I first heard the story of Shiyuni Sugihara. I knew from a very young age that my father was born in Poland, and as you heard, that when he was only three years old, he and his parents fled their home to avoid Hitler and the Holocaust. I remember hearing how shortly after Germany invaded Poland, my grandparents smuggled in the middle of the night across the border into Lithuania. And according to the story, as my father said, the adults who carried my father as a tiny child, and this he didn't tell you, the adults who carried my father through the woods told him that the wolves might eat him if he made any noise. That was how they kept him quiet. In middle school, I read book after book about children in the Holocaust. I felt compelled to learn their stories. 
They were strangers, yet their experiences always felt extremely close. After all, many of my father's extended family, including three of his grandparents, were killed in the Holocaust. I remember looking at photographs taken by Roman Vishniak, a photographer who captured images of Polish Jews who were forced to live in the Ludge ghetto in 1939. Ludge, as you heard, was the city where my father was born. And 1939 was the year in which he and his family fled. How close my family came to being the people in those photographs. By a miraculous twist of fate, the foresight and determination of my grandmother and the remarkable courage of one man, Shiyuni Sugihara, my grandparents and my father were spared. Thanks to Shiyuni Sugihara, I am here today. There are many people like me who owe our lives to Shiyuni Sugihara. We are the descendants of the lucky ones who personally experienced Sugihara's compassion and humanity. We are among those who thanks to Sugihara's moral compass have not only been able to live life's lives filled with blessing, but who deeply appreciate that just living life is a blessing. Shiuni Sugihara deserves credit and honor, not only for the number of Jews that he saved and for the lives of their descendants, but also for the accomplishments and the contributions each and every one of those individuals have made to the world. Thanks to Sugihara, the world is a better place. With the immense gratitude that each Sugihara survivor feels comes a parallel sense of responsibility. The blessing of survival means we take nothing for granted. We are here for a reason, to remember, to educate, and to pay forward the kindness. We must help spread light and hope and fight injustice. Sugihara was extraordinary because at a time when Jews were being stigmatized and marginalized, he treated them as human beings. He gave them hope and life when others sought to rob them of their dignity. Today, Jews are once again being stigmatized and marginalized. This time, however, it is not only due to religion or race. Today, Jews are being targeted on the basis of our ethnicity. Jews who take pride in our sense of Jewish peoplehood and in the Jews' deep religious, ethnic, cultural, and ancestral connection to the land of Israel are being pressured to shed that ethnic pride. The Jewish homeland, the Jewish nation state of Israel, where all races, religions, ethnicities, and genders are equal under the law. That is the only nation state today that is targeted as illegitimate. It is the only country that some say has no right to exist. This is today's contemporary form of anti-Semitism and we must unite to combat it. Because anti-Semitism is not just a Jewish problem. It is a cancer that rots away at and ultimately destroys societies that fail to curb it. I am the child of a Sugihara survivor. I grew up watching how my father devoted much of his professional time and energy to defending the Jewish people, to ensuring that Jews remain free and able to practice our faith with pride. As his daughter, I seek to follow in his footsteps. At the Brandeis Center, we work to protect the Jewish people and ensure that Jews are free and able to celebrate our ethnicity with pride because that is the lesson we learn from Shiyuni Sugihara. We must recognize, like Shiyuni Sugihara did, that even if we come from different backgrounds, different faiths, different cultures, different races, different genders, different ethnicities, we are all human beings deserving of respect and fairness, entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Lewin, for sharing such meaningful insights. 
It is now my honor to introduce our keynote speaker, His Excellency Kanji Yamanuchi, Ambassador and Consul General of Japan in New York. Yamanuchi-san, thank you so much for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning in New York, Washington, DC, and good evening in Israel. It is my true honor to address such a distinguished audience, members of Bnei Brits International and Combat Anti-Semitism Movement. First of all, thank you so much for sharing your family stories, Nathan Lewin. I was touched. I almost lost my words, but I continue to speak. Thank you very much. The Holocaust represents human suffering on a scale impossible to convey or even conceive. We must bear witness for the dead and the living, as Eddie Wiesel once said. We must remember the Holocaust to honor those who perished. We must remember Holocaust to achieve a better society for the living. And we must remember the Holocaust because we know that no country is immune from the forces of racism and the fa fascism. President Kennedy once read the line by the British philosopher Edmund Burke, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is a good man to do nothing. So I believe we have to do right things whenever necessary, but it's never easy. However, we know there are some good people who have courage to do right things even in the most difficult times. Ladies and gentlemen, Chiyune Sugihara is one of those who did the right things based upon humanity in the most difficult hours. From July to the end of August, 1940, according to the visa list remaining today, Sugihara wrote at least 2,140 visas in defiance of the government orders. It's been said that Sugihara continued to write visas up until the very moment he took the train abroad to leave Lithuania. By the grace of Sugihara's pen, thousands of lives were saved. Actually, Sugihara is one of my greatest predecessors in the Japanese Foreign Service. It means a lot to me. Honestly, I never faced the kind of situation Sugihara experienced, not even close. But I can tell you, in this profession, sometimes one must take hard choices on the spot. Sugihara faced the toughest challenge and he saved many lives, not because the government ordered, but because he believed in humanity. And let me express deepest gratitude to the Jewish people for keeping Sugihara's story alive. For many years, the humanitarian acts of Sugihara Chiyune were not fully recognized. And sadly, Sugihara once was regarded in Japan as an official who had failed to obey the instruction. Ladies and gentlemen, it was the Jewish people who recognized Sugihara as righteous. Sugihara's beta became well, fully, fully acknowledged because Japanese people have passed, because Jewish people have passed down his stories to the next generation. I sincerely respect and pay tribute to the Jewish people for keeping Sugihara's legacy shine. Ladies and gentlemen, here, let us briefly reflect on the Jewish refugees' incredible journey. After getting the Sugihara's visas, they traveled from Kaunas to Moscow. Then they took the Trans-Siberian Railway from Moscow to Vladivostok, and they crossed the Sea of Japan to the port of Tsuruga, Japan's west coast. After arriving at Tsuruga, refugees went to Kobe and Yokohama and eventually moved to destinations like the United States. Port of Tsuruga, where ships with Jewish refugees docked, is known as the port of humanity now. Unfortunately, many official records of that time were lost in a fire, but there are some documents and many heartwarming stories about how the people of Tsuruga supported the refugees. So they established the Port of Humanity Museum to let the world know what happened to those refugees. I myself have visited this museum and I was deeply moved by the exhibitions and taped interviews of the Jewish survivors and dissidents 
last November, they completed this inno innovation. The, fa the facility was much expanded to display more of the inspiring interactions and the connections between the Jewish and Japanese people. If you go to Japan, be sure you pay a visit to this museum. Ladies and gentlemen, more and more people have known, have more and more people have become to know the name of Sugihara because his courageous actions. So I would like to introduce one more Japanese diplomat, Tatekawa Yoshitsugu, the ambassador to the Soviet Union around 1941. What he did in relation with the Jews came into light recently. Last July, I received an email about a rabbi in New Jersey whose mother survived the Holocaust because of Japanese ambassador. Within a couple of days, I met this rabbi, Rabbi Aaron Kotra of Lakewood, New Jersey. He is the president of the world's largest Orthodox Jewish educational institute there. Rabbi, rabbi Kotler told me his mother's amazing journey, Michelle Friedman, only 17 years old at that time. Michelle visited the Japanese embassy in Moscow and tried hard to ask ambassador's help. Finally, against the instructions from the headquarters, Ambassador Tatekawa issued travel documents to her, as well as to thousands of other Jews in the Soviet Union. And I was touched when Babai Kotra showed me that these are autographed by Ambassador himself. Actually, that is a small piece of older paper, but her life was saved by that paper. To talk about Tatekawa, he had a distinguished career in the military. Then he was appointed as ambassador to the Soviet Union. The most challenging diplomat, the most challenging diplomatic post at the time. The thing is, he was a former military man. He had, he had, he had been trained to follow orders without question, no matter what. Today, we can only imagine what it was inside of his mind when he issued visas to Jewish refugees in violation of orders from the headquarters. The fact is, he decided to follow his own moral convictions. Ladies and gentlemen, people like Sugihara and Tatekawa made the solid foundation of friendship between the Jewish and the Japanese people. Now, we see the dramatic de development of cooperation between Japan and the state of Israel, like an investment treaty in 2017. And right here in New York and in Tel Aviv, we discover a lot of wonderful collaborations, such as sushi in kosher style. Ladies and gentlemen, Sugihara faced the situation where he had to choose either the order from the headquarters or his own humanity. Sugihara's story still gives us hope and lessons. He clearly showed that even in the darkest hours, humanity can still endure and the better angels of our own nature can make huge differences. Now, 81 years have passed since Sugihara wrote Bezos. On one hand, we see great progress in our economies, science, and technologies. But on the other hand, unfortunately, we still eyewitness new kinds of unrest and the revival of all the hate. Antisemitism is still a living issue. Prejudice has not disappeared from the earth. How many more times must we cry out, never again? So we shall live with the memories of Sugihara, Tatekawa, and other outstanding people so that we can aspire towards courage and grace. And so that we can hope to make the world a better place. The Japanese government will cherish the memories of Sugihara and we will honor and act in their spirit and sincerely wish we will be an integral part of the sacred effort to overcome hate. Thank you very much for having me here today. I really look forward to working together with all of you to enrich and deepen the friendship 
between the Jewish people and Japanese people. Thank you very much. Arigato. Thank you so much, Ambassador Yamanuchi, for your inspiring thoughts and your presence with us today. Next, we are joined by Kenneth R. Weinstein, the immediate past president and CEO of the Hudson Institute and former U.S. ambassador designate to Japan, who will share his insights with us about Japan's relations with the U.S. and Israel. Dr. Weinstein, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Look, it's, it's been an extraordinary morning. I am deeply honored uh, to be here as we pay tribute to the legacy of uh, Kuni Sugihara. Uh, I was glad to see uh, my friend Ambassador Yamanuchi also pay legacy to uh, Ambassador Tatagawa, who's uh, the incredible story that Rob Cutler in Lakewood is starting to tell. It's, it's, it's an extraordinarily moving story, and I think we're going to hear more about it. Honored uh, as well to be on the panel with my friend Elisa Lewin. Uh, extra extraordinarily moving remarks. Uh, I, too, am the, the son of, uh, of a refugee, a refugee from uh, Germany. Uh, was able to make her way to a number of countries, eventually Mexico and the United States. And I, I very much share in this spirit of the special duty that all of us have to make sure to stand up for human rights, to stand up against anti-Semitism uh, as, as an important uh, duty in, 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 and an important uh, part of uh, what we do professionally, morally, and the like. My subject today, though, is this trilateral U.S.-Japan Israel relationship. It's an increasingly important trilateral relationship, one with enormous potential, and it was something that really would have been a focus of mine had I had the uh, privilege of serving as U.S. ambassador to Japan. Let me note that uh, Israel and Japan are both proud ancient nations, peoples dedicated to learning that have contributed so much to mankind. They are, of course, stable democracies uh, in very differing ways, economic powerhouses, both, of course, face massive strategic threats uh, and challenges in their own rather dangerous neighborhoods. There are, of course, critical U.S. allies, and I would argue America's two most important allies in many respects. Now, Japan and Israel have undergone fundamental uh, changes in their foreign and defense policies under their longest serving prime ministers, uh, uh, unconventional leaders, Prime Minister Abe, who stepped down after eight years in office, uh, and Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, respectively, uh, which, is, which has led to significantly improved bilateral relations between the two countries and the enhanced importance of the trilateral relationship with the United States. Of course, Abe sensing the challenge posed by Japan, the threat of the North Korea ballistic missile and nuclear programs has dramatically increased Japan's defense spending and is almost as importantly shifted Japan's diplomacy away from its footing in multilateral institutions to a focus on key strategic partners in Asia and beyond. And of course, its alliance uh, with the United States. Uh, we've seen a strategic convergence with the United States and an unbelievably close partnership under the Trump administration that looks as if it's gonna continue in the Biden administration. Abe championed Japan's return to its status as a normal nation seven years, seven decades, pardon me, after World War II, uh, laying out the principles for the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, which the United States adapted, and working uh, with uh, partners such as uh, the United States, India, Australia, and the Quad, other partners in South and Southeast Asia, and Africa to meet the challenges posed by China and its Belt and Road policies. And in Israel's case, Prime Minister Netanyahu, also an unconventional strategic leader, has also sought to make Israel a more normal country, uh, taking its rightful place on the world stage. Uh, of course, uh, he also had an unprecedented uh, partnership strategic alignment with the Trump administration. Uh, Netanyahu, sensing the threat posed by Iran's nuclear and ballistic missile program, led this outreach to Sunni Arabs, culminating in the US-led Abraham Accords, which ended in some, which significantly reduced Israel's diplomatic isolation in its own neighborhood. And the prime minister also has used is the soft power of Israel's uh, role as a, a real technology hub, uh, a startup nation to help build uh, partnerships for Israel in Africa, Latin America, and especially in Asia, where Netanyahu has had, had a pivot to Asia. And I've discussed this with the prime minister in his office, as I've discussed Israel relations uh, in the prime minister's office in, in, in Tokyo, uh, partly grew out of frustration with European anti-Semitism uh, and also uh, grew out of a distrust of the Obama administration's uh, strategic intent in the Middle East. Now we saw 
Israel-Japan relations uh, significantly improve under Bibi and Abe, who personally clicked. Not an altogether obvious thing. These are profoundly different cultures. Uh, Japanese are incredibly hierarchical, polite. The Japanese language is one of indirection. And Israel's are, Israelis are anything but hierarchical, polite, and indirect, shall I say. So, but a few factors contributed to it. Uh, Israel used to be utterly, sorry, Japan used to be utterly dependent on oil imports from the Middle East, but, uh, and, and, and Japan distanced itself from Israel after the Yom Kippur War and the Arab oil embargo. But as Japan became less dependent on oil imports, it became less dependent on OPEC. Japan faces obviously a major demographic challenge. It's aging rapidly, uh, losing uh, hundreds of thousands of people a year as its population shrinks. Uh, and um, Japan has grown very interested in Israel as a startup nation and trying to learn from and also benefit from Israel's unique innovation culture. Israel likewise sought to decrease its dependence uh, uh, on the U.S. under President Obama and built out major ties in Asia, as I noted earlier, especially with People's Republic of China, leading to significant Chinese investments in Israeli infrastructure and, and high tech sector. Some of these investments are a real strategic concern to the United States, especially the investments in the Port of Haifa container facility uh, by the Chinese. Uh, and, and the Israelis are now much more serious about uh, looking more broadly at the challenges posed by Chinese strategic investment. It's one of the reasons why Japan has become so, another reason why Japan has become so important to Israel, it's because it's a country with trillions in capital to potentially invest around the world. Uh, if it wants to, as, as Japan moves from passive asset management to active asset management. Now, there have been three historic visits between uh, Prime Ministers Abe and Netanyahu, uh, which laid out a comprehensive partnership uh, in 2014, and in, uh, a Japan-Israel Innovation Partnership, a bilateral investment treaty, dialogues on cyber, counterterrorism, and military technologies. Now, Japan leads the world in numerous areas of technology, robotics, and material sciences, and some aspects of cyber, but Japan's Japanese industry is vertically oriented, consensus focused, and often risk averse. And uh, and this and recognizing this, Prime Minister Abe really sought to to try to pick up uh, on the fast-paced culture of innovation in Israel's uh, Silicon Valley, uh, uh, because in part Japan was starting to fall behind the People's Republic of China and and even the Republic of Korea in some ways. Uh, and so uh, the idea for Abenomics to use technology and innovation to promote growth, particularly as we move into the era of the Internet of Things, um, AI, big data, and the like. Now, uh, for the Israelis, obviously, there's, there's, a, there's a big investment uh, potential in Japan. There's a big economic partnership with Japan, but there's also a strategic partnership for the two countries. As Japan faces ballistic missile challenges from uh, the, the North Koreans asymmetric challenges from the Chinese, both Japan and Israel can share information and, and learn to meet these challenges, which parallel some of the challenges that uh, Israel faces and, and uh, in its region. And herein lies, I think, the hope for the U.S.-Japan-Israel trilateral relationship, a trilateral of strong technology and security-focused democracies with greater economic and technological cooperation. And just one example comes to mind, Prime Minister Suga, Current Prime Minister, Prime Minister Modi of India, recently announced a quad cooperation program on 5G technologies related to next generation telephony and the Internet of Things, which as we all know China has tried to dominate through Huawei and the China 2025 program. And the good news is that Israel is the only non-quad country that's been invited to take part in this, uh, in the, in this initiative. Uh, and it's a respect for Israel's role as a, a global technology leader. And the hope for the trilateral relationship is that uh, Israel, Japan, and the United States get into each other's innovation ecosystems, particularly uh, in defense, uh, with the hope that Israel would distance itself from China and Chinese investment, replace those with Japanese and Japanese partnerships in Asia. And good news on this in this note is that the new Japanese ambassador here in Washington, uh, Ambassador Koji Tomita, was the Japanese ambassador in Israel before. I should note that two of the last four Indian ambassadors to the United States served previously uh, in Israel. And I think this is uh, one way to assure that the trilateral relationship uh, moves forward is by having highly placed qualified diplomats who can do this while our societies and our industries do the same. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Dr. Weinstein. We'll now hear from another Jew who was able to escape the Nazis as a child, thanks to Sugihara. Ada Weinstein, we appreciate you being here with us today. I now turn it over to you. Ada, you're muted. You need to unmute, please. Oh, OK. For me, this was kind of a last minute thing because I didn't even know about your group and I'm so happy I discovered it now. Uh, so I, I thank you for inviting me and uh, it was wonderful listening to everybody speak. And I, my experiences when similar in, initially to, to the, the, the Levin's Le, Le, uh, experience, I'm not gonna repeat some of that. Um, they, I guess they call us the Sugihara survivors. In fact, I got a phone call one day from somebody who says, oh, I hear you're a Sugihara survivor. And I really didn't know what that meant at that time. I had to learn about Sugihara because my parents talked very little about, about Europe or, or their experiences. Um, I guess everybody in the family was killed in concentration camps, brothers, sisters, grandparents, cousins. Um, my, I come from Baranowice in Eastern Poland, and which is now in Belarus. And in, in uh, 1939, I guess the, the Russians came into Eastern Poland and at the same time, the Germans came in in the West. Uh, and when the Russians came in, they, uh, they just took over, uh, they confiscated my father's business. Uh, my parents were not religious, they were ardent Zionists. And my grandfather went to Israel in the late twenties and became one of the uh, one of the bigger developers in Israel and built actually the first big office building there in Tel Aviv. Uh, so they, my parents spoke fluent Russian and of course fluent Yiddish and Polish and my father spoke seven languages. So they were highly educated and quite well to do. Uh, but when the Russians came in, um, they they just the soldiers just moved into our house as if it was theirs and told us to get out. They confiscated everything my father had, their house, everything, their business, everything that they had. My father couldn't even go like to the bank, he said, and take out any money. So they just had to leave with some backpacks. We moved in with my aunt. In the meantime, the Germans came from the West and it was, it was 1939 September when they bombed us. Um, I remember being in, in the air raid shelter and thank goodness children need their their, their fathers, I think, their parents. My father would just hug me and say, don't worry, everything's gonna be all right, what the bombs. And to this day, there's certain things I have never forgotten. They're always in my head. Um, but we were, um, my father owned a saw, sawmill in, in Poland and the business was quite good. And my grandfather moved to Palestine with, with uh, one daughter and one son and their families. So. My father uh, wanted to just get away because he wasn't, they weren't afraid, he said, of the Germans. I mean, no one expected them that there would be a Holocaust, but he was afraid of being taken into the Russian army because if a Jew went in the Russian army, uh, they didn't come home. And, and a number of the Jewish boys, actually their, their thumb was cut off, the, like the mother, would, or the parents were cut off their thumb so they could not hold a gun and go into the Russian army. Um, so my parents decided that they are, they've, they've got to get out and they begged their sisters and brothers and, and my grandmother and everyone said, my father, they were crazy. They're two little children. Where are they going? They don't, you know, where are they going to go? So, so like, like, like Nathan, we actually, um, I guess my parents hired some people and they carried me. And my sister uh, walked, my sister was five years old. I was five and she was 10. And they crossed the border in Lithuania. And on the, uh, on the border, we were accosted by uh, Lithuanian soldiers pointing guns at us. And I remember my sister just dropping on her knees and saying, please don't kill us, please don't kill us. And we were separated for 48, for 48 hours. My, my, my mother and I, my sister, 
and my father, and I guess then reconnected again. And so we, we went over the border into Lithuania, and we were basically illegal, illegal immigrants there. Uh, we spent a year there. I have no recollection. I may be at age five. I guess I'm a therapist, so I think psychological. But at age five is an age of high anxiety. And suddenly, like overnight, my my family, my house, everything was taken away from me. And I say I developed total amnesia of that period of time. I, in fact, I wanted to get hypnotized at some point to see if I could remember anything. Um, so we were in Lithuania, and I guess that's where we we came across Sugihara, and we thank Sugihara all the time because if, if not for him, I would not be here. My I wouldn't have my children, my grandchildren. Uh, when we uh, my father could not get one of the one of uh, a visa from Sugihara, but there were a number of people who began to sell their visas because they didn't have the money for a ticket. The tickets were quite expensive then. Um, they didn't have the money for, uh, and also they were afraid to get on the Trans-Siberian Railroad because they they knew because a lot of people were just pulled off the train and never and never returned. So my father was uh, fortunately my grandfather in, in Palestine at the time uh, had some money, so he sent my father money to buy tickets for us. So we we took the train, and and, and the visa does say uh, it's it's it was a transit visa. They wouldn't give permanent visas, and and the visa does say Curacao as the destination. Uh, we took a train to Moscow from um, then the Trans-Siberian was 11 days on the locked train. And my poor father, I mean, they, they didn't get me a seat because you didn't have to pay for children under six. So when uh, uh, when they the conductor came along, I, that I always remember and asked for, for identification and I guess, you know, asked how old um, I was, my father said five, because then he didn't have to buy a ticket. So my father taught me to be honest. I said, I'm six. I always remember that. So he had to buy me a ticket. Uh, we took, we, we stayed in Moscow for a few weeks and then we took the Trans-Siberian Railroad to, it was to, to Vladivostok, the port where the ship was sailing from to go to, uh, to Japan. Um, that ship was so old and broken down. I remember the suitcases just rolling around the whole deck and three voyages later, that ship sunk. Uh, but when we came to Japan, you know, the Japanese didn't have to let all, all those uh, Polish Jews in um, because from, from what I've read, Sukihara's visas, uh, transit visas were not approved. The Japan did not want, did not approve for him to give us those visas. Um, but they let us all in. And when we, and, and my own theory is that because of the Germans, they couldn't openly say it's okay for all these Jews to come in. But what we found that the Asians in general, the Japanese were really religion blind, religion and color blind. They were, we spent a year in Japan and they were most kind to us. The neighbors, um, I guess there were, there were Jewish committees that found housing for us, like in factories, so we all lived like in one room. Um, but the, uh, some of our neighbors, uh, they brought us food and, and uh, they got us to go to school. So I, I started school and I learned English, started in Japan while I was in school there. And they were really very kind, kind people. They'd always, you know, the army didn't have that reputation, but we lived with them in Japan. And then um, I guess they, they knew that Pearl Harbor was going to come. So they, they, shipped, they shipped us all out to Shanghai where I spent the war years in, in Shanghai, China, in a ghetto. And in 1943, a German general came to Shanghai and, and wanted the Japanese to build concentration camps for the Jews because there were about 30,000 Jews in Shanghai um, and the Japanese refused. But what they did, they put us in the ghetto instead, which was certainly better than being in a con concentration camp. 
So we stayed in Shanghai till 1948. The war ended in 45, but America wasn't letting us in either. They, they took their time in letting the refugees in. But when I look back on, on my experience, the, during that period, we traveled the whole distance with the Mir Yeshiva, which is the only yeshiva to remain intact, uh, you know, during World War II. They were all saved. Um, and Sukihara saved them, really. There is a wonderful movie called Prastana Non Grata, if any of you haven't heard of it. It's made in Japan. It's a documentary, but it's done with actors. Um, it's a very good movie and very true to life. When I was watching the movie, I thought I was one of the children in the movies. And I wondered how my parents survived the life that we had, you know. Uh, but if not for Sugihara, we wouldn't even have this story to hell to to tell. It's it's amazing, and and uh, I'm glad he was. He's you know he they call him the the Japanese Schindler, I guess. There were people who saved Jews, and there are nice people in the world who are not prejudiced. We just hope there were there would be more of them. But thank you for inviting me. I I. This was really a last minute thing, and I'm really so happy that I heard of this program and that I was able to watch it. Thank you, Ms. Winston, for joining us. We're so glad you're able to join us today, too, and, and thank you for sharing your story with us. Juri is a Tokyo-born mural artist who now lives in Oklahoma City. She will present a special mural of Sugihara she created and discuss its significance to her. Juri, take it away. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Okay, hello everyone, thank you. And Ambassador Yamanochi, thank you for being with us. Um, my name is Yuri. I'm a Japanese American mural painter and artist. I was born in Tokyo, but I spent most of my time in Japan was actually in Kobe, which is where the Jews went when they came to Japan. So that's pretty cool. Um, I paint murals all over the US and also I've painted in Israel and hopefully soon in Japan also. Um, my work usually portrays traditional Japanese themes like historical characters and kabuki actors, um, and I combine it with bright colors and modern elements. Um, but another big part of my work is unlikely courage. So that's why I was so delighted to be able to make this painting of Sugihara-san, and it was made possible by a grant from Combat Anti-Semitism. So. Um, the reason why I painted it was I was really hoping that through the universal language of art, um, I as a Japanese person would be able to shine a spotlight on true courage and true love for humankind as was exemplified by Sugihara-san. So um, let me, let me show you how big it is. Can you see? So it's really pretty big. Let me show you some of the details close up. It's hard to do this on Zoom, let's see. So that's a portrait of Sugihara-san from one of the historical photos we have. And the text is from the Lewin's visa. So they were kind enough to send me their visa. So that's the exact text from it. And here's the stamp, his official stamp. And the chrysanthemums represent the government of Japan. And we even, I'm not, I'm very bad at this, but <laughs> if you can see the Japanese leaves, they also may look familiar with some Jewish looking elements. We happen to have those in Japanese patterns sometimes. So it's um, guzen coincidence, as we say. I don't know, but anyways. That's the piece I created. So. Thanks Thank so you. much, Jerry. That mural, the mural is beautiful. Thanks. Thanks so much for sharing it with us. Before we conclude our program, I would like to introduce Sasha Reutman Dradwa, director of the Combat Anti-Semitism Movement, to offer a few words. Sasha, all yours. Thank you, Laura, and thank you everyone for joining us today. I must say that I've seen the number of people watching and is a sign. It's a sign of people who wants to learn, wants to learn the story of Shugiara and wants to be better people. So thank you, Bnebrit International, for being a partner with us to tell the story of this hero 
the, the hero that saved thousands of lives. Today, it is estimated that 40,000 people are living to the courage of Shugiara. Thank you, Ambassador Yamauchi, Yamamuchi, to be with us today, to say these kind words and, a strong, and to share a strong relationship between the Jewish people and the Japanese people. Now, I just would like to say that I'm also a survivor, but I'm another kind of survivor. I'm alive today because other people saved my grandparents. My grandparents in Belgium were saved, were in hiding during the whole war. And today I'm in life due to the kindness of people that stand up to hatred, that stand up when it was out to do it. And I think that what we learned today is that it's possible. It's possible to stand up to hatred. It's, it's easy to hate, but it's difficult to love. And this is what we want in this event to share that is possible. When we see anti-Semitism growing around the world, we know that something should be done and we need the rewards of the past to teach us how to be better people, to create a better world. So this is why today we were so pleased when the Holocaust International Day is coming in three days from now to remember those that help saving lives. So thank you everyone for being with us today. And really, I think that if we have young generation that will hear his stories, learn about his stories, we're gonna have a better world. So thank you everyone. Thanks so much, Sasha. And thank you to everyone for joining today's event and for staying with us just as we ran a bit over time. We hope you enjoyed the program and came away with a deeper appreciation for Sugihara's heroic legacy. Thank you once again to our esteemed guests. And we look forward to seeing all of you at a future combat anti-Semitism movement and at the Neighborhood International event. Be well and have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Right. Thank you.